Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, so today we have a guest speaker, Dr. Daniel Wall from Fit Lab Australia. Uh, he's an interim co-director and he's currently an accelerator for now. So maybe you can open your presentation and tell us about the report that you brought to us. Please welcome. Thank you, gentlemen. As Gunn said, I'm going to talk about the HetLab OU. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about the uh, state of Tasmania, the university, and basically where the HetLab in Australia is at the moment, and also follow on to take a look at some of the things we're doing, some of the things we're about to do, and then to leave you with essentially an, an open uh, slate to let us know what you think and to feed into the system. It's going to be the Hit Lab Australia. So, <clears throat> what I'll do is give you a little bit of background. Um, for those of you that, that don't know me, uh, you'll find out a little bit about me and where I fit into the scheme of things. Um, we'll also talk about, as I say, the Hit Lab. In other words, where are we? What have we got planned? Where are we going? Um, for that matter, why are we? And uh, hopefully you'll get a better idea of what is happening. It's not very far from the Hit Lab New Zealand. So, <clears throat> who am I? Well, me, Dan. Okay, that's my name. Um, what do I do? A number of things. I largely, over the past few years, have fulfilled administrative roles. So, the Hit Lab Australia is actually embedded or has been embedded in the School of Computing. It, it's now moving out in, into a more ecumenical role uh, within the faculty. Um, I've been essentially the Associate Head of School, which means the Head of School in, in Launceston, which is one of the two campuses, or two main campuses of the university. I've been looking after the management of the HIT Lab, which means organizing who gets what bits of money we have and so on, and other stuff. Now, my background and expertise, um, if I go far enough back in time, it starts off in physics. What I teach at the moment in the university uh, is in the areas of, of networks and network security, um, embedded systems, mobile systems, and I like to play with things. I like toys. I like bits and pieces that you can get your hands on and you can do stuff with. And I'll show you one of the little bits and pieces that. Um, from time to time, I get the opportunity to play with later on. Um, research, uh, really essentially there's a couple of main things that I'm actively involved with at the moment, and one of those is to do with education in the space of networks and security, and the other is something that um, I do with some guys who work in engineering and hydrodynamics, which is remotely in autonomous underwater vehicles. One of my interests, it's a whole range of things. Um, I started life as an astrophysicist. I've been working in medical physics, teaching and learning, a bit of marine sciences, and essentially anything else that goes. So I'm a bit of a jack of all trades. So, <clears throat> the Hit Lab AU, where are we? Okay, how many people have been to Tasmania? <laughs> Only two. Anyone not know where Tasmania was until I put the map up? <laughs> Wouldn't surprise me. Okay, HitLab New Zealand, you're in the South Island. HitLab Australia, we're in the South Island. <laughs> North Island's a bit bigger than the North Island here. Um, the university has campuses in Hobart, in Launceston, and also, it's not shown here, but there is a, what they call the Cradle Coast Campus up on the northwest coast. There are really three different communities that the university deals with. The northwest coast, it's essentially agricultural. Launceston is, is kind of a combination between, I suppose, the uh, government center mentality and also the agricultural. In Hobart, it's largely government-based functionality that exists there. And the university is dealing essentially with, they're not uh, three totally different types of audience, but they are essentially a, a disparate bunch of, um, of groupings of people. Um, so it's difficult to actually find focus. And what the HIT Lab Australia is doing is providing that focus on the Launceston campus. So one of the 
aims of the Hit Lab Australia is to essentially be one of the leading, let's say, institutes, one of the leading focal areas in the Launceston campus. But that doesn't mean that it's only focused there because its goal is actually to be statewide and basically, as Hit Labs anywhere, to actually feed into uh, the well-being of the nation um, after the state. So, <clears throat> Tasmania, since there's only a couple of you that have been there, um, it's actually quite unkind what people say about Tasmania and Australia sometimes. Because you can tell a Tasmanian because they have a scar on the side of their neck. Um, and as the postcard actually takes um, a big dig at, uh, Tasmanians were reputed to have two heads. And one of them gets removed, and it's not necessarily the right one. Um, <laughs> but anyway, what's Tasmania good for? All of the things that you have here in New Zealand. It's, it's a real focal point for um, good environment, organic growing of things. So fruits, uh, wines, natural beauty, seafood, all of these things that you have here are all the things that the state has to offer. And from that point of view, um, Hobart, Launceston, wherever, these are the kind of community things that in targeting kind of university directions one can, can actually focus upon. So looking after the community means looking after agriculture, it means looking after production and, and so on. Um, so plenty of places to go bushwalking or I think the technical term here is tramping, whatever you term you use, there are beautiful places to go here. Probably not quite as arduous as some of the walks you have, although if you go down to the uh, southwest of Tasmania, you can be seriously challenged with some of the walks that are there. So <clears throat> it's a beautiful place to be. It's a great place to live. It's a great place to um, get out and about. There's half a million people in the state of Tasmania. So you can drive down a four-lane highway and curse the fact that it's busy because there's another car in front of you or you see one coming the other way, and only one. Um, <clears throat> this is down the road from where I live. This is within, certainly within 10 minutes of the university. And this is the gorge. This is the, I guess, key attraction of Launceston. You walk from the bridge where this photograph was taken, and in five minutes, you're in the town center. Looks beautiful, tranquil, nice walks on either side, except when it rains for a few days. And then that gorge becomes a grade five whitewater canoeing run before it becomes a grade six. Well, there is no grade six, so that's when it's too dangerous. I guess. The point of showing you these two slides was really that when I picked these, it wasn't just to show you sort of the interesting aspects of the place, but in terms of the environment, environmental monitoring and keeping a track of what is happening, informing people about the nature of the place around them is important and is within context of what the Hit Lab actually does. There are places that you could walk in Launceston where there are um, old telegraph poles, wooden poles with markers that are about sort of at this height that actually indicate where the floodwaters came back in the early part of the 20th century. So advanced warnings, particularly important. Um, it's certainly an interesting place and hopefully some of the floods we've had in the past will not be uh, actually repeated. Or at least if they are repeated, they won't be as, as devastating as they have been. Um, so, where are we? Well, <clears throat> what I showed you in the picture of the gorge is actually, it's down this, sorry, reach it somewhere down over here. It's hard to see where the gorge is. But about 10 minutes, you come to the university campus. It's by the river, fairly picturesque, and the red circle on this picture indicates the building which houses the hit lab. So maybe I can ask one of you guys to knock up a little augmented reality application so you can kind of focus in and, 
and give us um, this little toy to play with. So, okay, what are we? Bit lab are you? Well, we're family. We're part of the group. We're part of the three, maybe four, maybe more Hit Labs. And <clears throat> we essentially have a lot of similarity with the Hit Lab New Zealand in terms of what it is that we're trying to set out. The most important thing are that we have good guys over there in Australia. You have good guys here. There are good guys in Washington. And there are opportunities within that space for collaborations. We have a vision space, just like you guys have got a vision space. Um, in fact, I think we were using the picture of your vision space for a while on our advertising because we didn't have any decent pictures. But now we do. And this is actually highlighting something that I'll mention um, when I go through the phases of the startup of the, uh, the Hit Lab Australia. This is our vision space with three screens. And what it's actually showing is um, our student by the name of Shannon who developed uh, a motor racing simulation um, using R Factor, which some of you who like those games may have come across. It's a platform on which you can develop motor racing circuits. And that's actually been a big advertising draw card for, um, for the lab and was very important in its startup. We have similar kind of setup to what you guys have got. So we have the mirrors, the projectors, so there's reflection um, and back projection onto the screens to make the space small. And in fact, the format for our vision space was essentially the design that you uh, used here. So we've stolen a few things from you, at least ideas, if not uh, technology. Um, <clears throat> we have the same setup, so we have infrared tracking. We have the same kind of tracking markers, the same system that uh, you guys use as well. And <clears throat> I think this is actually important because it's a connection that I want to kind of bring to all of your uh, attention. Um, we've essentially got the beginnings of, of a hack space. We've got about 30 people that are interested that come from within the hit lab, within the school, and also from wider. Um, and by wider, I mean we've got connections with arts and so forth. Um, these are guys that, like me, they like playing with things. They like playing with bits of hardware and, and so forth. And in fact, we've actually had a number of people that have been donating I equipment to this hack space. Um, one of the things that we want to do with the Hackspace is to build some kind of window on other worlds. And we'd be really interested in getting some kind of window on the world here, as much as we're going to have windows between the participants in Tasmania itself. And so at the moment, we have Launceston, we have Hobart, we have some activity in our um, visual arts schools because they're interested from an artistic point of view in using technology in order to showcase sort of artistic and creative ways of uh, disseminating information, sensor gained information and so forth. So there's an opportunity there to get involved in something that's um, a little bit wider than just either New Zealand or, or Tasmania. Um, and we have at the moment just uh, a Skype account that we're going to use to activate sort of a connection to us, but hopefully we'll be able to come up with better ways of people in these different environments um, to interact with each other. So <clears throat> that's kind of what we are. Um, why are we? Well, <clears throat> it's a similar model to here. So we have a slight difference in the way that the, the kind of three-pronged model for the HitLab operation works in Tasmania because we actually have an undergraduate teaching program. So we have teaching that is essentially going to fuel research and research which is going to fuel commercialization. And commercialization gives opportunities to our students. It brings in money. The teaching brings in money, produces students. So this is the basic engine for the HIT Lab operation. It's different because you don't have undergraduate students here. Um, in Washington, they don't have undergraduate uh, specific hit lab undergraduate teaching. And it's kind of an experiment that has been happening for three years. And over those three years, we've seen a steady growth in student numbers. And that is only happening on the one campus. And so the expectation would be that as soon as um, the powers to be, etc., allow us to unleash the model on the wider university, um, operation so that we can be teaching into 
other campuses, we would expect to have much more engagement in the, in the undergraduate teaching. And we get people that come in not only from the IT background, but also people that come in from a variety of backgrounds. That has been the focus of our undergraduate teaching, to bring in people from different, different schools, different faculties, to try to build connections so that we can actually operate as some ecumenical organization where we sit above the different schools and faculties and connect people together. And even at the undergraduate level, you get synergies that build that actually give rise to good ideas that can then be developed into, uh, into research projects. And I'm sure you've come across similar to this list of objectives where essentially we will be developing technologies to solve pervasive problems and we'll be using students so we're providing projects to fuel those, uh, those students, to drive those students through and um, build the bridges to commercialization. So that's essentially our four uh, major objectives and that's the economic engine. Now, what do we teach? Well, this is the structure of the HIT Lab major. So we actually offer eight undergraduate units, one third of a degree. And we start in the first year by teaching essentially the foundations of virtual and augmented reality technology. And we get a lot of interest from uh, engineers, certainly from, from the Maritime College, architects and so forth, who for those first year units have an opportunity within their very sort of cram packed degree structure to actually do some electives. So engineers normally have a, a full kind of 40 hour working week with very little room to, they just don't have a choice, they can't actually do electives. Um, in fact, it was only last year that the engineers and the Maritime College were given the opportunity to do two electives out of the whole degree. And one of those was fixed and that left them with one that they could do. So they had choice, but you had to choose what you were told to choose. So from the foundations of the technology, then we look at user interface design, um, fundamentals of inter interactive entertainment. These give sufficient foundations to allow students to engage in a project. And the project is something which can be sourced from industry. It can be sourced from staff. It basically is a good idea that allows a group of students to work on, on something. And I'll give you an example of um, one of those projects shortly that has uh, actually received some very good publicity. Um, and again, a lot of the things that we're doing at the moment have essentially a, a secondary purpose. Not only are we driving this engine, but we're also trying to provide opportunities to get our name out there in public because it's only with community backing, with community support, that the university support will kind of flow. So we're, we're essentially, I suppose, dealing with um, growth of the organization on a number of fronts. And because I knew that you'd actually want to see a nice colored graph, um, this is just a graph that I pulled out of our um, report for last year. And the good thing is the arrow is going upwards, which means that we're seeing more students every year. It's interesting that having been on study leave for a little while now, um, and not actually having to lecture in front of students, um, I was wondering whether PowerPoint withdrawal symptoms were actually going to kick in. But I've been presented with an opportunity to, to defuse that, so uh, you get to see these slides. Um, <clears throat> As part of, of our research development, um, basically as a group and with uh, the help of uh, Professor Furness, we actually had a brainstorming session or two or more and worked out really the areas that we basically could contribute in and how those areas connected with requirements from industry and in connecting the areas that we were interested in with the areas that industry were interested in, we can find those hot points of project areas that are likely to attract funding. Okay, so these are the key things, the key connections. Um, on the left-hand side of uh, 
this particular slide, you can see adaptive interfaces, smart sensors, tracking, and visualization and simulation as being four main areas that, um, that we in Launceston uh, believe that we can make contributions in. And from the university point of view and from the industry point of view, what we have along the bottom axis are just some, but these are probably the major areas that we can connect with in the short term. We have a very strong agricultural research center. Uh, we have very strong medicine connections. In fact, medicine is, is not just Launceston, but it uh, also extends through the Menzies Institute to um, the other campus in Hobart. And the Menzies Institute is specifically dedicated towards uh, research in essentially the health domain. Um, we have strong education faculty uh, on the Launceston campus. Um, architecture and design is also strong on our campus. I'll show you a few more areas that are strong as well. But also in the north of the state, mining is a particular uh, powerful industry. It's not necessarily as good as it used to be because mining obviously is suffering from, uh, at least in Tasmania, um, the idea of a green state that has mines does not necessarily go well together. Um, but certainly there are some well-run, good mines, and miners have money. And so it's always good to keep them on side. So that's a little bit of background about the lab itself. Um, and what I thought I'd do is essentially to show you uh, the PhDs, or at least to make mention of the PhDs. Uh, we have four PhD students that are well underway with their projects at the moment. And these are kind of guys on the level of many of you who may actually be uh, useful to talk to or to chat to, maybe even through that Hackspace window. Um, OK, one PhD project. and only one to start with. Thomas um, has been working on augmented reality in a nursing education domain. And the particular problem that he has been looking at is a problem that um, occurs when you take like a first year student and you try and train them in wound care and they have to worry about making sure that their practice maintains uh, clean conditions. So the way that you treat wounds, you have uh, as a nurse a special pack that you have to open and you have to take out your equipment, which is essentially a sterile mat, a sterile tray, sterile tweezers, and sterile swabs. And you wish to maintain sterility of that equipment. And adjacent to where you set things up, you have a patient, and the patient is probably anything but sterile. And the idea is that you use the sterile swabs on the patient and you don't contaminate the swabs or the rest of the instruments that you have, okay? Now you can have someone that monitors that and watches and gives you one-on-one -on -one feedback, but with augmented reality, you have the potential of augmented reality with vision, with vision can capture whether or not you are touching the right or wrong thing and can give you visual feedback to tell you whether contamination has happened. Okay, Steve is doing his PhD in mixed reality interfaces. He's looking at digital museums. In fact, just learned this afternoon that Steve's off to Germany for four months to go and work at uh, is it Constance University, where he's going to be liaising with them to learn a little bit more about mixed reality. But he's very much focused on the experience inside the museum space. And um, he's generated a a couple of demos that you may have come across. He was actually at the OzKai conference at the end of last year with a little three-dimensional augmented reality puzzle. So you pick up pieces um, of virtual cube and you put them together to make a cube that has pictures on each side, just as a demonstration of a way of interacting um, with augmented um, reality. Third PhD is to do with um, 
I'll notice you have one used as a coffee table out there. Well, Mark is using one of these um, touch tables, and he's interested in tangible interactions. And so at least his initial ideas, and he's at the beginning of his PhD, so his ideas are, are essentially being formed at the moment. But he's interested in actually using one of these um, touch tables with tangible objects and using that for uh, a resource management, environmental monitoring kind of capability so that people who are discussing problems um, and solutions within that resource management space can visualize more readily what the outcome of making a particular change to a system might be or making some kind of, um, of decree that you, know, you will do this because you know, the water is cloudy, therefore we will stop doing this. And so by simulation and connection and using this um, tangible interface, uh, it allows people to more readily see what is going on. So that's the focus of his PhD, but that's in the early stages and no doubt that will come into much sharper focus as time passes. Um, and the fourth one, Simon, who's, I suppose, got a bit eclipsed by the old Kinect um, a little bit, but he started looking at gesture, and still is looking at um, gesture controls for GIS systems. And <clears throat> he has developed his own um, gesture control system. He's now actually starting to look at the way that the Kinect um, can maybe do it a bit better, or maybe do it differently from what he did. But uh, he's working with, um, amongst others, uh, where his second supervisor is actually um, working in Hobart with the Antarctic um, guys. So um, his second supervisor is interested in using GIS information simply because of Antarctic information. And he has this wonderful octocopter that um, he flies around Antarctica with a sensor package on it. Not Simon, but his supervisor. Um, okay. They were the four PhDs that we've got uh, happening at the moment. Um, and what I thought I'd do now is just sort of briefly run through some of the other things that we have done and show you a few pictures about, um, about those things and give you an indication of why I think they've been quite useful. The first one's useful just because it's fun. I mean, we've had people that have come in, um, you know, chief of police or the deputy police commissioner or whatever, that, uh, you know, when the chat sessions in the vision space finish and there's a few people milling around, um, a Longford motor racing circuit is something to play with. And to get sort of grown men off of one of these systems is actually quite difficult sometimes because it's, uh, and we have the bucket seat and we have the full kind of rig that we put sort of right at the focal point of the vision space. So it is a, a seriously immersive experience. But that's fun and it illustrates a point. It illustrates that we can take people back to 1967. Longford, which is about a 15 minute drive from Launceston, used to be the site of one of the Formula One motor racing events on the World Motor Racing Championship venue. It was closed in 1968. It was closed because it wasn't that safe. I think back in the 60s there were no motor racing circuits that were particularly safe. But Longford was not safe at all. Um, they used to, there's a couple of areas where there is uh, you know, bridges over water, they'd have scuba divers in the water, just in case. Um, and they lost uh, a few people um, in, that, uh, in that time. But it gave us fantastic coverage. It gave us essentially our first boost in terms of uh, recognition uh, statewide. Um, <clears throat> CP Escape, the second application, you can download this for your iPad or iPhone. This was essentially the second thing that got us kicked off. Um, I have a couple of pictures in a minute where I'll show you briefly how that works. It's just a way of scanning between two images so that as a tourist you can actually, and it's not as sophisticated as, as the City View AR, but it's a way that you can stand at various um, interesting spots 
and you can call up pictures. They may be works of art or they may be um, old photographs and you can match them with a photograph taken very recently and you can kind of fade between the two and see what has changed, appreciate difference. Third, the magic map is something which is an ongoing um, development, part of a development um, idea. And this is augmented reality, taking real-time sensor information from sensors from the CSIRO, which is the major Australian um, science research organization. And so in real time, given a 2D map, a picture of Tasmania, you can use the magic map application in order to see a 3D version of the state with sensor data. So wind, temperature, pressure, whatever the CSIRO sensors have captured, you can see those over the state and you can tune back and forward in time. You can switch between different sensors and so forth. So that's actually um, now becoming part of a larger project idea that I'll, I'll mention shortly. And a few slides ago I mentioned our third years to a project. Well, world play is something that uh, was even mentioned on Triple J. Triple J is one of the major radio stations that play decent and interesting music for, I was going to say people of our generation, but you're not of my generation and I'm not of yours, but music that most people of uh, their 20s and people that would like to be 20 again enjoy. Anyway. We got statewide uh, and also national coverage for this. And that is a project where the students can be in the vision space, in an immersive 3D environment, and they can be building and designing. Um, and there are other projects here. And I'll just point out the guy in blue, and you can ask him about other things after the, after the talk. So I'm sure that uh, you get another first-hand bit of inside information about what has happened in, uh, in the lab. So that's a photograph of the Longford motor racing track in 1967. That's a screen capture of the replica track. It was actually developed from Google Earth imagery um, that was put into R Factor. R Factor gave the track. Um, and in fact, there's an add-on to R Factor that allows you to, to build the track. Um, and it took about a year and a half it was one guy's labor of love that he did in the evenings and so forth. So Shannon essentially, uh, unwittingly, gave the hit lab this beautiful tool that, that we could use. Um, it's hard to read, but at the top of that slide, there are a couple of links that um, I won't go to now, but they take you, if you're interested, um, later on to uh, YouTube videos. Um, there are a number of YouTube videos that capture some track action from this simulator. That's CP Escape. Again, if you Google on CP Escape, you can find out where to download the iPhone application. It comes with maps, with viewpoints, and what you can see here is kind of one photograph, second photograph, and typically the photographs are taken at a time when something interesting and different was happening. So floods down the gorge and no floods down the gorge, and you can basically see Hopefully you're in a no flood point. Um, you can see the, uh, the changes that happen. <clears throat> and that's magic map. So <clears throat> 2D map, 3G projection, and the sensor information that's overlaid on that. And these are tangible. In other words, they are little disks that you can turn. And on top of the disks, there are indications of what you have turned to accept. In other words, you can change the type of data that's being mapped and, and so on. That's just one way that you can interact with this. Um, <clears throat> but that was essentially the first uh, project that the Hit Lab actually undertook to develop that. And world play. And um, I think this is the advertising advertising shot for Worldplay where the 3D world and you can actually be in the 3D world and you can use um, six degree of freedom hand controller to actually point and click and build things and create an environment. And that's likely to be a useful concept for many reasons. 
um, certainly for architecture, even for naval architecture. Trying to build a submarine in closed space and you actually want to see what is going on as much as doing urban development and so forth. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of good follow-on from this. Um, and there are more, and I'm conscious of the fact that I can go through these um, and tell you about them and you'll probably all be asleep by the end of that process. But I'll just pick a couple and maybe show you a few, a few little pictures. One that's happening here. So <clears throat> I think that's Tom's left arm or right arm. Um, to do with health, and in particular, we're looking at aged care. So giving an elderly person augmented reality, say augmented reality capabilities, so that where they have exercise regimes, they can actually follow those exercise regimes and get feedback from the system without requiring a trip to uh, a clinician and someone to look at them one on one and to deal with this. So, with Ghostman, we are looking to work with aged care facilities. We're also looking at exploiting the broadband network because, as some of you may know, Australia is in the process of what will be an eight or ten year exercise of rolling out a national broadband network where, at least in theory, you have maybe 100 megabits per second to the home. Um, I think our internet at the moment is probably a little bit better in terms of the rates at which you pay than it is in, in New Zealand. Um, I think I pay about $50 a month and I get 25 gig download. And that's the bottom of the it's kind of the, the El Cheapo. In fact, it's not 50, it's 40. That's the El Cheapo entry. Um, but with 100 megabits per second, to all households, then you've got the capability of actually having uh, this technology rolled out in people's homes, and that's where we see this deployed. Um, another project that we've actually uh, got the beginnings of, and along with Ghostman are waiting to find out whether we have uh, won any funding, is um, an AI modeling of uh, elderly people and their likelihood of falling. So monitoring people over a period of time, developing a model that hopefully can help to predict the likelihood of a fall event. And by doing that, then what we can do is to get interventions happening um, early, rather than waiting for someone to fall, in which case you've got a lot more expense associated with the healthcare in dealing with that. So that's uh, a monitoring, vision capture, data mining, and then AI modeling that goes into, um, into that. And then there's games, games for old people. I guess I'm on the verge of being what is classed as an old person and I get a great deal of fun out of a lot of these games. Along for the racing track's bad because I just sit down there all the time in that bucket seat. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Somebody might download this and say, well, you should be doing other things. Um, okay, a few other things in in um, in train that we can do. We've we have at the moment uh, a large range of coverage, um, a philosophy project at the top, a game to teach some philosoph philosophical uh, fundamental points. Um, <clears throat> we've got engineers that are interested, typically in urban design. Um, 3D modeling and so forth. We've also got the Maritime College, and I want to come back to this in a minute, but the, um, the pilotage, piloting of ships, and I'll say a, a few more words about the Maritime College if for no other reason, and I just think that what they do is actually quite cool. Um, <clears throat> and a few tools that we've developed on the way. So let's have a look at um, who there are to work with. These are some of the people that we've been speaking to. Computing and information systems, that's what I work, that's where the hit lab is based physically. And so, yeah, we've got direct connections. But we also have a maritime college. We have an advanced nursing training facility where they have 3D mannequins and, and so forth that you can physically interact with. 
um, <clears throat> education, architecture, visual and performing arts, and so on, all of these people have shown interest in what the HitLab can offer. In Hobart, we've actually got all of the traditional schools, some of which don't actually have a presence in Launceston. So physics, for example, doesn't really exist in Launceston. If you want to do physics, you have to go to Hobart. And in Hobart, there are these centers. A men's center for health, IMAS, which is marine and Antarctic science, and the CSIRO, which is not part of the university, but is actually an extremely well-funded government body for science research. So the Maritime College, in a nutshell, ships, water, a lot of cool stuff, and cool stuff that's big, but they make little models of it. The Menzies, a whole raft of research um, thrusts, all associated on health. And IMAS, which is a relatively new institute that has connected a number of what were disparate research areas to do with fisheries, aquaculture, coasts, climate, and so on. Certainly these guys are very much interested in simulation activities. Simulation and the presentation of results, of visualization. And so the nice fly-through map of, of New Zealand that you guys have got that's available in the, uh, in the vision space here is something that is of interest certainly in the um, IMAS area. So the Maritime College, ports and shipping, we've got two major centers, engineering and hydrodynamics, conservation and resource sustainability. And I do a little bit of work with the engineers. Well, I've got a multi-million dollar ship simulator. So I can, I can sit in the bucket seat of the Longford motor racing track, and that's nice and small, and it's just a car that I'm actually piloting. If I want to go a little bit up in size, I can take on a 100,000 ton oil tanker and try to bring that into, in this case, this is a picture of Sydney, but try to pilot that and to dock that. And um, that's pretty interesting because some of these ships, when they actually go into dock, you actually have to stop them, you know, park them nicely where you've got a, a few meters on either side of the ship where the ship is, you know, 50, 100,000 tons or something. You bring them into their berth. So you need to be fairly accurate in what you do. And giving information to the captain and to the pilot is particularly important. All of this stuff is real, apart from the imagery. So this is a room that you go into where you are on, effectively, a ship's bridge. They have five other rooms with smaller ships with this physical equipment. Now, what an opportunity for augmented reality, virtual reality, to take over a lot of the hardware that they've got there, for bringing together the information that's being displayed on all of these screens and allowing a ship's captain to operate in a, a much more efficient way by seeing what is necessary when it is necessary. And this is kind of cool. You like playing with model boats, simulation, modeling. So they have water testing facilities. They do a lot of work for the government, for the uh, defense. Uh, not that we know what they do for defense, but they actually, they look at models. They look at the hydrodynamics of things. And so modeling and visualization of those models, particularly important. And they have a cavitation tunnel a ca cavitation is something which happens when um, <clears throat> you have pressure within water that causes water to essentially, um, essentially boil, but it's to do with pressure, not with heat. And so when you have uh, a prop, when you have m something moving through water, to study these effects, to visualize these effects, and to bring that information into design is particularly important. And they have a cavitation tunnel that's now operating, which is probably the best cavitation tunnel in the southern hemisphere. So they can study all of this stuff. So there's a lot of physics, science, modeling, and visualization that goes into, uh, into that. 
So a lot of scope for augmented reality, a lot of scope for things that allow pilots to, pilots and ship captains, basically to do their job better. Maybe not even to have to fly a pilot out to a ship. You, know, you just sit in your office and you remotely connect to a ship and you can pilot it in because you have all the information necessary uh, to drive the ship um, and so on. So a lot of opportunity there. And people are already working in this space. So this is a, uh, an augmented reality um, application which essentially gives you what look like guardrails. So your course is set out. You basically follow the red line down the middle of the road. Um, <clears throat> there are companies in the, or one at least company in the States that markets this to the, uh, to the military. Um, but you can envisage infrastructure. I mean, the, this looks like it's a buoy or buoy. You need them because they're kind of physical and if all else fails, some of them will actually make a noise or you can see them if the weather's clear. But they can all be virtual. You can do away with a lot of the technology that is there. Um, and also monitoring, environmental monitoring, capturing data from under the sea, which is a growth area. I think the, uh, the plan that I saw from the Chinese Academy of Sciences suggests that by the middle of the century, they are going to essentially be populating the submarine world. They're going to be putting people, scientific bases, under the sea. And within the next 20 years, probably have a capability to work down at around about five, six kilometers under the water which is a pretty steep engineering feat. But again, it comes back to um, modeling and simulation and allowing um, the people that work there to actually be able to interact with the technology in an alien environment. So again, augmented reality is something which you're seeing uh, grow in the diving, you know, the submarine um, operating uh, environment. Um, I'll probably wrap up in a minute, but uh, this is really to, to point you at a few, I guess, key words that keep coming out, like visualization, like simulation, the capturing of data, the data being available to researchers, to the community who wish to use it, and the provision of some kind of set of uh, APIs or an API to interact with it so that you can visualize, so that you can get the most out of it. So a standard structure, if you like, and, and this is something that is essentially going to happen in Tasmania. It is something that is going to happen more widely in other countries and throughout the world where data is there for people to make use of. And the tools, and this is where we come in, the tools to make that data useful, to allow people to interact with it. That is going to become one of the guiding themes what we do. And so what do I do when they let me out? Um, they let me out for too long, so I came to New Zealand. Um, but occasionally they let me out for a day or two and I go and play with this little guy um, and its predecessors and its post -sessors, successors. Um, we have our own little remotely operated vehicle that we play around with and we take it out to um, a place called Beauty Point. It's a lovely name. It's at the end of the estuary, which is about 30 to 40 kilometers away from, from Launceston. And essentially, we chuck it in the water. And um, the idea here, and this is the revision, this is technology that's been built by students. It's been engineered by students. And the electronics and stuff in it um, has been something that I've put together with a bit of help from, from a student. Uh, and we are going to use this device to actually start doing some um, autonomous projects. At the moment it's remote, we're going to move to autonomous projects. And what we're looking at uh, is how to interact with the device, how the device can do its job, but have a better way of interacting with, um, with people or people with it. I'm not quite sure whether this will work, but no. I'll come back to that later on. I have a little video clip. So, <clears throat> ready to wrap up. In essence, 
there's a lot of things that we are going through at the moment. We've been running our teaching program for the past three years. We've started to get a pipeline of students that are coming out and they're now filling our research positions. We are essentially open for business on the research front. We're starting to attract funding. We're starting to get projects. And we have ideas. We are always looking for good ideas. We are always looking for opportunities to collaborate. And being open for business, we're kind of open to almost anything. We have a few things that maybe we wouldn't do. Um, yeah, someone told me you could bungee jump not far from here. I don't know whether I'll be doing that in the next few days. But that's a little bit of insight into your sister laboratory. And if anyone wants to ask me any questions, or if you want to have a discussion about projects, about ideas, um, we can start that process now, or you can chat to me at any time, probably over the next well, few days, probably. I'll be a bit thin on the ground thereafter. But um, yeah, open to questions. Um, I don't think, we haven't actually worked anything out yet, I think, but I, I don't see any reason why there would not be exchange programs. I had a brief chat with Mark, and certainly he's keen for guys from Australia to come out here, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't happen the other way around. Yep. So I think if we have a project, if you have an idea for a project, then come talk to us, and we'll see what opportunities actually exist. Also, the scholarship program. You mean the elite scholarships? Um, PhD, elite scholarships. So we have a number of elite scholarships. Elite simply means that um, you get probably it's an extra 50% on top of what a PhD student would normally get. And there are opportunities for, um, I think New Zealand, there wouldn't be any fee structure for doing PhD in Australia, but we, we have opportunities to waive the fees on a PhD, um, plus the elite scholarship. So you know there's there's an incentive, and if you take a look at the um, the website, the HitLab AU website, there are some projects that are actually um, advertised that we have on offer at the moment. Actually, it includes a trip. Check it out. The elite okay. Didn't matter. Trip right. Australia. <clears throat> we get a laptop with this plus. Well, there you go. A trip, a laptop, and what more could you want? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All of our PhD students at the university now are given with a are given a laptop. Um, whether that's a laptop that you would actually want to have, or whether you want to upgrade it, I don't know. <laughs> okay. Especially master students yep. to continue work. Or we're interested in having the Tasmanian students that finished their mm. bachelor's. Yep. So that will be the best kind of internship that you can have. Mm. Uh, along with internship. Yeah. Program. Yeah. Yeah. So given that we're kind of fairly young in this process, I think essentially everything's on the table. So if, if anyone has interest or if you have ideas, then talk to Tom, talk to me, um, flick an email across to, to the lab, and uh, basically we'll take it from there. We'll explore the opportunities. Let me add one other thing. Uh, the, the, sort of the, if you look at the themes that are emerging from the different hit labs, pretty much the, the hit lab US has been device or hardware technology. Uh, the lab here has been in reality, uh, solve kind of things. I think that what you're going to find in uh, emerging in uh, Australia is going to be the, the design and visualization of science applications. Mm. Yeah. We're really heavily connected with the uh, School of Architecture and Visual Performance. Yep. Uh, really, design program. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, as Tom says, I mean, visualization, simulation, that there is so much of that that is essentially in use in all of the, the schools and faculties. It's a, basically a prime area to, you know, for us to target to actually develop our, our research strengths there. One of the things we have on the agenda is actually connecting the two vision spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the a world play could actually be something that you could be anywhere but in the same three dimensional virtual immersive environment, constructing whatever it is that you're constructing. So you work with people anywhere. And you can demonstrate that simply between, as Tom says, New Zealand and uh, Tasmania. And there are several postdoc positions that are Yeah, I don't know too much. They're, they're, they're coming out soon, from what I hear. But uh, stay tuned on our, our website, because you'll see that now is the time of opportunity. It's a time of growth. And we're looking to bring in people. Um, not that I'm trying to steal people from the Head Lab New Zealand, but uh, it is a time of growth, and there is opportunity in Tasmania. OK. Well, thank you for staying awake and listening. <laughs>